This week we're going to be in Psalm 11, so you're certainly welcome. There's Bibles in the, in the chairs underneath, or if you had a smartphone, pull open a Bible, uh, iPad, whatever you got. We invite you to use that and follow along. I'm going to just slowly walk my way down through most of the verses in Psalm 11 there, and so you can just follow along. But to get things started, I wanted to tell you about uh, this. I, I'm one of those guys, I get sucked in like on a Saturday afternoon, I'll be sitting there flipping through the channels, and you'll see one of the old war movies on, right? And, and it can be a really campy, cheesy, terribly filmed war movie, but somehow they suck me in, right? And, and, and I just have a hard time flipping past those. And uh, in one of those, um, this, this idea comes up about how much dynamite does it take to blow up a dam, okay? And, and of course, the answer to that is it all depends on where you put it. And I learned that from watching a movie, and some of you may know this one. It's called Force 10 from Navarone. Anybody ever seen that? Yeah? You can see Harrison Ford, a young Harrison Ford in there, right? Harrison Ford is in it. Robert Shaw is in it. There's, there's some big names in this movie. Um, I remember the first time I watched it, I was like, that's Han Solo. Oh, I mean, uh, 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 that's, that's, that's Harrison Ford, you know, because I'm of the Han Solo generation of Star Wars, right? And so... I'm watching this movie, and, and, and the good guys are led by these guys here, and their job, you can see that bridge in the background. The job that they've been given is they've got to blow up that bridge. This is a, a vital bridge in Yugoslavia that the Nazis were using. And so they were tasked with blowing this up. And when they get there, and when they see it, and they see the buttresses in the bottom of that bridge, they have like a suitcase filled with dynamite. And they realize... There is no way, we're not even going to like, it's not even going to be a mosquito bite onto, the, onto that bridge. It's not going to hurt it in any way if we use this dynamite on it. So mission over, right? I mean, you quit and you go home. Of course not. That's not the way our soldiers do it, especially not in the movies. And so the men decide that upstream is a dam. And, and as they're thinking about it, they're like, I think if we take the dam out, the, the water that comes might take the bridge out. And so they hatch this plan on the fly. Um, Harrison Ford, Robert Shaw dress up as Nazis and they go marching up and somehow in horrible, horrible false German accents convince, convince the, uh, the, the Nazis to let them through and they march their way down the dam all the way into the bowels of the dam and precisely place uh, the dynamite where the demolitions expert had told them to put it and, uh, and then of course once they get it set there once the dynamite's in place they set it and it goes off and it makes a ginormous explosion sound. I mean, boom! I mean, the, they shake the cameras, you know, in the old way they used to do that. And so the camera shakes, kaboom! And then, all, you know, all the other guys, all the other good guys, they hear the explosion and they're thinking, woohoo! But nothing happened. It was just a big bang. The dynamite goes off making a huge noise, but nothing happens. Now outside... The guys go from jubilation hearing the explosion to not seeing any rushing water to, to almost panic. And they turn to the demolitions expert. And he just sits there and he smiles at him. He reaches in his pocket, pulls out his pipe, fills his pipe, lights his pipe, starts smoking his pipe. And he says, patience. You've got to have patience. And he just sits there smoking a pipe. And, you're, and as you're watching this, you're going, okay. And at that very same moment, it switches back again to where Harrison Ford and, and Robert Shaw are at. And all of a sudden, you notice little cracks beginning in the cement, right? And then water begins to psh, 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 squirt through the cracks. And it's at that moment, these two guys realize, uh, we better run. <laughs> and they run. They, of course, you know, it adds an element of excitement. They barely make it out of the dam before the dam collapses, sending an avalanche of water rushing down this river valley, comes downstream, and just, just as the Nazi tanks, just as their jeeps are starting to cross over the bridge, along comes the water, whoosh, washing the bridge away. A lesson, if you're listening to it, of the power of cracks in your foundation. If you know what you are doing, you don't need an atomic bomb to wreak havoc. A little bit of dynamite in the right place is all that it takes to do the trick. All it takes is a few little cracks, well placed at the right moment, and then the whole thing can come crumbling down. 
That brings me to a familiar question that comes from Psalm 11.3. Psalm 11.3 says this. It says, when the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Now, we don't know exactly when David wrote this psalm. Many writers tend to, uh, the commentary writers, tend to connect it to the time when Saul was chasing David. He was chasing David all throughout the wilderness, uh, 1 Samuel 23 time frame. But we can't be exactly sure because it doesn't actually give us a date for the psalm. But we know this, this psalm, it, it, it comes at a desperate moment when David's enemies seem to be closing in around him. And it was in that moment that David's friends were encouraging him to run away. So the psalm is best known for that one question, that question, when foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? And as I, as I studied this, and as I looked at this passage and thought where I wanted to go, I found many other preachers have taken it in a different direction than I would. That they've used this text to show that when the foundations are destroyed, that there is nothing that the righteous can do. They're left hopeless in that situation. But I don't think that's what David says. When the foundations are destroyed, there are many things that the the righteous can actually do. But above all else, for us to do that, we have to get a right view of God. And as we look at the first three verses, we'll, we'll see that they describe David's predicament here. Uh, let us consider the commitment that we make, that we even face probably in this very moment, of the uncertain times in our world. And let us consider how this then applies to our lives. Psalm 11.1 1 says this. David says, I have taken refuge in the Lord. How can you say to me, escape to the mountains like a bird? Now first, we should say this. It is okay. It is not wrong to flee persecution. Okay? The brave Christians that live in the Middle East currently who who face beheading from ISIS on a daily basis, there's nothing wrong if they choose to flee and seek safety for them and their families. But sometimes, sometimes you can't escape, right? And sometimes... Sometimes, in fact, the Lord calls you to stand and face whatever may come. You see, God's people are not required in any way to prove their faith by staying in place when they have the opportunity to flee to the countryside. If you think about it, after all, what did David do? Well, when Saul was persecuting David, he had to flee. He had to run. He lived for years Dodging, hiding, avoiding Saul and his men. Because Saul wanted to kill David. Remember, Saul was the king and David was the anointed next king. And Saul wasn't too happy about that fact. So there are times that we must not flee. There are times, though, that we do need to stand and fight. And so when David's friends encourage him to flee the country... David examines that and thinks about it. And his reply to them is this great, great reply. David knows that's not the right thing for him to do in that moment. And he says, I have taken refuge in the Lord. If God can't protect him, David says in this moment, it doesn't matter if I run to Egypt, it's not going to be safe for me there. He says, wherever I may go, they're going to chase after me, so I'm going to stay here in this instance. And I think oftentimes we can apply those same truths to our own lives. When we think about the condition of our world, I apply the the same idea to the place where we stand in this day and age. I'm not uh, one to really spend a lot of time dwelling on these sorts of things normally, but as a casual observer of our culture, it would seem we're at a point as a nation that there's just a lot going on that makes me really wonder where will we go next? Where we see things that might indicate 
things are getting a little tougher for us as Christians. Now, I don't want you to think as Americans were persecuted as Christians. We're not. We've not reached the place of persecution. I don't sleep at night worrying when somebody's going to kick down my door because of my faith. I don't I, I'm using a microphone today. We've got a cross on top of the building. You know, I did a baptism in a lake recently. We don't hide our faith. We're not being persecuted. But in general, we seem to be trending in a direction where there seems to be more open hostility towards people of faith. And it's my fear that if it continues in that direction, things will happen because of people's convictions. People may be losing jobs or struggle to find jobs. Uh, one of the things that keeps coming up is, will churches lose tax exemptions? Will, will pastors like me lose our housing exemptions? That comes up. Will we see a day and age coming in the future where if we speak out about our faith, then we'll be attacked for our faith, where we'll be told to sit down and shut up as believers? Maybe we'll reach a day someday where many other believers, many other Christians are ashamed and afraid and unwilling to stand up for their faith and will tell us to quit doing so for our faith. Maybe that day won't come. I don't know. But I've seen the history of Europe. I've studied this. I have a degree in history. And I've seen where things trended there. And my hope and prayer that that does not follow suit in America, but it seems to be trending that direction. And so, with that in mind, that brings us to a place where we have to consider, do we stand and fight, or do we flee? Now, I believe as believers, we are to stand and fight for those things in which we believe. And then, at the end of the day, leave the results in the hands of God. They have a saying in the Coast Guard. I have a friend who used to be in the Coast Guard. And the saying is, you have to go out, but you don't have to come back. This is no time for us to flee in America. This is no time for us to, as Christians, back down from our beliefs and convictions. Because, frankly, I don't think there's any place to go. I don't think there's a better place to go. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to have the freedoms we have. Moving on to Psalm 11.2. It says, For look, the wicked string the bow, and they put the arrow on the bowstring to shoot from the shadows at the upright heart. I think David is being quite literal at this point. At one point, Saul tried to kill David with a spear, in fact. Later, he sends his armies after him. The arrows that they were shooting at him were not metaphorical. When those arrows would hit, they could draw blood or kill. David knew persecution. Psalm 11.3. Again, it says, When the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? The word foundations in that passage is interesting. It refers to the moral and the spiritual underpinnings of society. What can the, the, the righteous do when the foundations crumble beneath them? Do we quit? Do we despair? Do we run? Do we become bitter? Do we resort to violence? Again, if you were a Christian in the Middle East right now, I have a, a good friend who's a pastor of Iranian descent, and his family obviously is Christian. For him and his extended family who still lives in Iran, this is not a rhetorical question. What do you do when your community is destroyed by ISIS? What do you do when the world comes at you because of your faith? What do you do when the foundations around you are being destroyed before your very eyes? What will the righteous do? What can we do? Well, the answer is, it depends again, on your view of God. If you have a small God, then you've got a big problem. You can quote me on that. If you have a small God, you've got a big problem. 
But if you've got a big God, you'll be okay, even when it seems like the bad guys might be winning. Notice what David doesn't say. He doesn't call for an army to mount an offensive. He doesn't say, let's run for the hills. He doesn't say, let's raise lots of money so we can have a big political campaign. He doesn't say, let's start a big argument on Facebook, on the internet. I think the internet was a little slower in David's time. But he doesn't say those things. For David and for us, it's not about the what, and I've said this before, it's about the who. To be sure, tactics do matter. There's certainly a a time to go to war to protect your nation. But I believe in times like this, we need to seek God first and seek God foremost. When our foundations are being hacked at, when the world is trying to push us away, We have to go back to our foundation and back to the core of the things that we believe. And that's what David does in verses 4 and 5 and 6 and 7. Psalm 4 says this, The Lord is is in His holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. This is David's way of saying, you know what, guys? God is everywhere. And God is still sovereign. God is in control of the whole of the universe. Now, I might admit it doesn't always look that way, right? The world is broken and full of sin. It seems like sometimes our lives are spinning out of control. It seems at times the bad guys are winning. But as I mentioned in communion earlier, I've read the whole book. I know how the story ends. There is no surprise in Revelation 29. If you're looking for that, that's a joke. Jesus wins. Love wins. That's not so we would be prideful. I didn't do that. It was him. But when we begin to worry about the direction of the world, when we fear about the moral compass of our nation, we can rest our hope that God is still good and God is still great and God is still sovereign and that God is either on his throne or he isn't and I believe that he is David believed that he is and so what happens here on earth still falls under his control but right at this point we see the, the fundamental difference between a believer and an unbeliever. We, we, we see in a believer who believes David here that God is sitting on the throne, that the, the God, the creator of the universe, who is absolutely sovereign, the God whose ways are far above our ways, the God to whom the whole of the human race must someday give an account to, that that God is in no way surprised by what's going on here. One of the things we talked about in our sermon series on time is there's nothing new under the sun. While we are all yet sinners and broken, I guarantee none of us has invented a sin that was never committed before. Same problems. We have the same problems that have been here since Adam and Eve. And God looks down and is never astonished at our creativity and sin. He's seen it all before, folks. As we construct our faith, as we examine the Bible, and as we hopefully grow in our faith, one of my long-term convictions as I've been a pastor is there are a couple of verses in the Bible that are fundamental, that are key, that are critical for us as Christians in our belief. And perhaps the most important, the most fundamental one in all of the Old Testament is the very first verse, Genesis 1.1. It says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Right? You all know that. And if you can believe that, you shouldn't have a whole lot of trouble with the rest of the Bible, frankly. The truth of that statement 
is so strong. And yet, the truth of that statement eluded me for years. I couldn't quite get it because I'd never really thought about Genesis 1-1 in its larger context. But it is hugely important. The Bible begins with a declaration and not an argument. It simply says that God was and He created. And once you get that settled in your heart, a lot of other problems and questions resolve themselves. You may not be familiar with this passage, but in Isaiah 6, it says this. It's a great passage to illustrate this point. Not a passage that you might probably get tattooed on your body somewhere. If you're into that, I'm not. That's okay if you are, but I'm not. But in Isaiah 6, it says this. In the year that King Uzi died, period. Now, why is that important? What does that matter? Well, you should know this. King Uzi was perhaps the greatest, the best, maybe not greatest, but best king in the history of Judah. And if you've read your Old Testament, there's a bunch of guys in there who did not, did not, did not honor God. They did evil in the eyes of the Lord, it says, right? If you've read your Old Testament. And it's important to note this, that Uzi, one of the the best kings in Judah, that when he died, the nation plunged into turmoil. The golden age of Israel's history was drawing to a close. And the question arises, would the, the people of God continue to walk with their God, or would they return to the idolatry that so many previous kings had led them into. And it's in that moment that Isaiah comes face to face with God. You'll know this passage. You don't know that part, but you'll know this part. Isaiah says it this way, I saw the Lord seated on the throne, high and exalted, and the train of His robe filled the temple. Where is God? He's seated on his throne. God has been where he always was. Seated on his throne. Even when the great king dies, God is seated on his throne. Continuing on with Psalm 11. It says, His eyes watch, he examines everyone. The Lord examines the righteous and the wicked. He hates the lover of violence and he will bring... Wow, this is powerful. He will rain burning coals of sulfur on the wicked, and the scorching wind will be their portion. Does that mean tomorrow after you sin, God's going to smite you? No. That's not what David is actually saying, although it kind of reads that way. What David is saying, however, that we need to be aware, we will not get away with our sin. Dr. Martin Luther King said it this way, He said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. That eventually, it might not be today, it might not be tomorrow, but sin has a way of catching up with us. And eventually, each and every man and woman will give an account. God works in His time and not in ours. But David is warning us, and he's being very clear, that our sin will find us out. So these words of David remind us that there is a a solemn and an eternal difference between the righteous and the wicked. A difference that is sometimes easy to see in this life, but sometimes it isn't so easy. Because sometimes the wicked prosper, right? Sometimes the godly struggle and fail. If it would only be as easy as, you know, like, You ever go to a football game, you walk in, maybe the Vikings are playing the Packers, it's pretty easy to see which side you support, right? You can tell quite readily if they're wearing green and yellow or purple and yellow. You can see. But our spiritual alliance isn't always so easy to see. But God sees everything. God reads every heart. He knows our thoughts. He knows the words that we whisper in the darkness 
And He knows us better than we know ourselves. Verse 7, He says, For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds. The upright will see His face. The Lord stands up for those who stand up for Him. David stands on the peak of faith and he says, though the battle might be hot, though we might be surrounded in this moment, God will win in the end. And I think this is the true position of those who believe God and His Word. As Christians, we need not despair, folks. If God is on the throne, and I think He is, then we should rejoice because these are our times. We don't have to worry about the future because we know the one who is in control. I serve a God who is eternal. And he's going to be down working long after I'm in the grave. And that's David's final answer to the perplexing problem of life. We hold on to the Lord. The Lord remains good and remains sovereign. So folks, I'm not one who will give you any political advice whatsoever. That is not me. As a Christian, I believe we should vote, but I don't believe we have to vote. It's a freedom. You're free to exercise it. I would encourage you to, but you don't have to. But regardless of whatever happens this week, God is still in control. God is still sovereign. We still need to love our enemies. We still need forgiveness ourselves. As Christians, we need to take the long-haul view because we are in this for the long haul. So what are the righteous to do? Pray. Act on your convictions. Live out your faith. You want to make a difference in this world? You don't make a difference in this world in a voting booth. I'm sorry to tell you that, but that's the truth. You make a difference in this world by loving other people. You make a difference in this world by serving other people. You make a difference in this world by putting others before yourself. Did Jesus ever vote? No. But he said, submit ourselves to our government. Pray for our leaders. So over the next couple of days, let's do that. Let us lead in the way as Christ led in that way. Pray, love, serve. And at the end of the day, know that God is sovereign, that God is good, that God is still in control. And we still need to seek after him. Three final things, and you'll see these on your notes at the bottom. As I think about this question, I keep coming back to the same conclusion. What should we do as Christians? And they're written there for you. We need to be tenacious, we need to be winsome, and we need to have courage. Tenacious means we don't give up. Winsome means that we face life with a smile and not a scowl. Courage means we do the things that need to be done. Tenacious means we keep on doing them. Winsome means we don't lose our temper when we don't get our way. Courage means we take a stand for the truth. Tenacious means we keep on praying. Winsome means that we'll remain cheerful even when others attack us. And courage means we will do the hard things without complaining. Tenacious, tenacious means we love people anyway. Winsome means we display grace under pressure. And courage means speaking up instead of wimping out. Let us not fear, folks. No one knows what will happen tomorrow, but our God is faithful to keep each and every one of his promises. So don't be discouraged and do not be shaken. Christ is the firm foundation, the cornerstone that shall never be shaken. So as you go forth this week, go forth with that security that God is still with us, 
then we must continue to do our part, living it out each and every day. And if we do that, if we love well, if we serve well, if we are generous and giving, if we are a forgiving people, then we will change the world. Amen. Let us pray.